fain of you living. It has the same words, but it doesn't mean the same thing. Exactly. So um, I've been involved in sustainable living, living sustainably for a long time. And I was involved uh, as a founder of the Phoenix Permaculture Guild. Some of you are familiar with that. It's now the BCA. And I'm no longer associated with that. I got tired of going into Phoenix. And I set up an East Valley Permaculture Guild called the Rio Salado Permaculture Guild. It's based out of our home. Our, I mean, my wife and I. Uh, we have a home site that we call the Bee Oasis. It is a sustainable place. It is just a regular residential home site, so it's urban sustainability in, in that respect. But it has a lot of things happening on it that are uh, demonstrations for other people to come and visit, see sustainability, sustainable practices in action. And in that way, I'm helping to encourage and I'm helping to guide other people to be more sustainable in their own lives. I want to walk my talk and I want other people to begin walking their talk. I'm definitely an activist uh, proactively in that I want to help other people do the same that I'm doing. So one of the things within the Rio Salado Permaculture Guild is a work share program and a tool share program and the knowledge share program. So that's part of it. I have a lot of knowledge because I've had a lot of experience throughout my life and I want to be able to impart that and help other people get started. It's, it's always the first step that's hardest for some people to take. It's always the first practice. It's always that getting going and then having the encouragement to keep going and having someone to lean back on once in a while just to get that little bit of a you're doing fine, just keep going kind of support. So uh, within the guild itself we have a program in which spring and fall we do a project and that project we do we group together as a community so this is about this is my theme about doing it together we got to do things together we we don't have enough muscle and enough time to do it all ourselves we have to get together and we have to work together and we have to sweat together and play together and eat together and all of those things that's so important to me to bring the community together and then empower somebody else to be more sustainable. And how am I doing on time? Good. So uh, I can keep going for a bit longer. So the, the guild itself is designed around community. It's, it's not about me. It's about how many other people can be similar to me in their own way. They may not do the chicken. They may not do the rainwater like I do. They may not do the garden like I do. But they can do bits of it. They can start with a compost. And they can put potted plants on a patio of their condominium. And they can do their recycling. And they can use their car less. And they don't have to use a dryer. They can put, they can put a little line up or put a rack, clothes rack up and they can dry their clothes out in the Arizona heat because it's a dry heat. And there are so many things that we can do as a sustainable practice that doesn't mean we have to change the world, but we can change ourselves. And it's one person at a time, it's one home at a time, it's one community at a time, it's one city at a time. And we, so we associate ourselves with the transition movement because they're about changing the, the city from the top and the bottom and coming together in the middle to meet the people. Because we're in the middle and there's so many things on the, on the extremities. They're not talking to each other. And so discussion, meetings, classes, gatherings, teach-ins, all of these things are all part of the process in which if we hear it once, we say, hmm, maybe. If we hear it again, we say, hmm, maybe. If we hear it a third time, I'm going to do it. Sometimes it takes that many times for us to actually make a move toward what it is we heard a while ago, last year, three years ago, 
this class, that class, that person, this teacher, that guru, this practice, whatever it might be, sometimes it takes that long. And so we're here today because today is the day. You, one of you is going to get it, right? How exciting is that? Well, my name is Sylvia Boulier. Um, I uh, wrote in 2005. I could probably fix it, fix it up, uh, revise it some, but uh, diet exercise guidelines. There's a billion books that write about the same thing pretty much, but some of these the diet books, they have what I would consider, um, in my view, uh, uh, misleading or kind of going down a uh, shady path uh, of certain, uh, certain things that I don't like. So I wrote my own little thing, um, um, but I don't think I'm going to write any book because there are some really good books out there that do go the same way. Uh, I'm more oriented to uh, raw living foods. So the way I could get into uh, uh, a piece of the puzzle Don's project is, yeah, I, I couldn't grow anything to save me, but I could haul dirt all over the place because I'm strong. <laughs> haul stuff rocks and I, and um, uh, you know, people uh, you know, encourage them to consume the raw foods that are grown in such products. Okay. Um, and so the more raw it is, the better off. The more processed it is, the, more, the less life force that it has. It's critical. A lot of ailments, all the all the diseases out there. Um, uh, a lot of it's due to diet, as well as just stress, as well as lack of exercise. But diet is big. And so um, uh, the raw foods have everything. They have loads of protein. One of the one of the things that that concerns me is the overemphasis on protein. And they always think, they ask me when I weigh protein, it's like low pressure. Where do you get protein from? You know, I got, I'm really strong. I've got my health problems, mostly digestion, but I'm very strong. And I don't do bars even. I, I don't go to bars and drink it. I don't eat the bars either. <laughs> energy bars. I don't do energy drinks. It's just too much. You know, I don't look forward to being a breatharian, but I'm headed there. And I love food. So it's my downfall. And, There's a ton of protein in apples and fruits, blueberries, um, uh, even uh, potatoes are great, have great painkillers. Oh man, the potassium is serious, it's great for pain, I've discovered. Um, and um, so I, I, do, I do like my breads and, and rice and stuff, but I try to at least get 50 to 60% raw food, a lot of onions and garlic and, and turmeric for seasoning. Whole bunch of analysis about seasonings. You want some table salt, you some lamb salt. That's great stuff to balance your pH and do all kinds of other things, little electrolytes. Um, uh, the, the thing about the raw food is that it has enzymes, it has life, it's like scrubbing bubbles. You know, enzymes are like these jumpy things that have life. And so, um, uh, versus the, the pasteurized and processed foods that are pretty much dead, even the bread. Ezekiel bread is a little better. It's more of a whole sprouted bread. It's a lot better, but it's still, you know, it's still kind of processed. My stomach takes it on. It's a process. It makes it harder to digest. Um, and with all my problems, I do a lot better if I can just not eat, not eat the rice cakes, crackers, bread, blah, blah, that I like. You know? <laughs> I can't kick the habit yet. Um, I'm still working on it. But um, I've got rid of dairy. Dairy is nasty. Mostly what I advise for people with just about any ailment, from arthritis to heart to infections, etc. Get rid of the trans fatty acids. Uh, anytime the oil has been cooked, it's been compromised in its molecular structure in some way. Um, and uh, stick to cold pressed oils like coconut oil and olive oil are very helpful. Multiple uh, fish oils are good on the people, but I can see the merits in some fish. I tell them three years. Fish. It'll work. You know, yeah, they can work for you all the, you know, you know, and there's only so much you can do at this time. So let's work with what we got. Um, and uh, then uh, uh, I also advise 
to stay awake from added sugar. You're going to see a lot of writing where people condemn fruits and carrots. Oh, but they seem to get this. And I'm thinking, boy, they are crazy. You know that South Beach diet? They will approve of hard liquor because there's no glycemic index number on it. So therefore, you can drink hard liquor. Gee, isn't that nuts? I think so. And I'm not into the chemist. They're like, dude, what dude? What was he on when he wrote that? Stuff. <laughs> and hard liquor, just because it doesn't show a number for like, you need to drink full acid. OK, yeah, wipe yourself out. <laughs> now early. <laughs> Thank you. 
watch out now for uh, for now is canola oil. Nasty. So uh, I have to now have up my label reading uh, the whole level. Um, even the lecithin granules I've ate for, eight, for years, I've got to get the non-GMO lecithin. Wow. Well, I got to watch for that now. Uh, and I gotta pay 15 bucks for a thing of less than versus four bucks for a regular run of the mill soy less than. Now they got sunflower less than. That's a fat emulsifier. If you're like this, it'll help you drop it. It doesn't help me anymore. I'm always fighting that 10. I'm always fighting 10 pounds. It does affect me. But um, yeah, so am I just about. Yeah, out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so sign the sign in sheets, everybody. Pass them around and then we can keep it. And I'll have the compassion communication on for after this panel. If you didn't get there, because I didn't get there until later, I can do it again in a few minutes for you. I have all the handouts for compassion communication. Thanks. Thank you. That was very impressive on the food and quite educated food. Um, and used to. I like to actually express my gratitude and joy uh, that for the people who have organized this. This is a wonderful effort to bring. <laughs> bring this uh, idea together and also for every everyone else of you that have come here to share the ideas. Um, it may look like uh, of whatever size today, but the effort is, the aim of this effort is so vast that it starts locally, but definitely goes globally. So I have all my mind and heart for it. Uh, I belong to an organization called Ananda Marga, which literally means a way to happiness. Uh, I started uh, part of this organization being a monk. Uh, mostly working in India. In 96, I came to the Philippines. And I largely worked with uh, many social service projects, and some of them included education, providing relief and welfare uh, kind of projects for children, tribal people. And uh, I was also part of something called Union Minister Education. And we were trying to redefine the way how our, uh, how our education system works. Uh, right now, we have a lot of good stuff in education, and mostly like uh, Montessori and Bible and those kind of education system. But our, my spiritual master was trying to improvise on that, add something on top. And what he was trying to do is redefine the concept of uh, new and where we try to look at things with the perspective of this is good for me, this is good for human body, human mind, human nature. But he says that we have to look a little bit beyond that and see that it probably sometimes things may, may not be good for human society, but it's good for the whole population. So that's where he called a newly defined humanism or new humanism. And then the kind of compassion and love what we have for our fellow brothers and sisters, fellow beings, has to be expanded to non-fellow brothers and sisters. I say cats and dogs and everything. They are brothers, sisters, and people. They are part of our society. Then he goes even beyond. He says that even inanimate beings, stones, soil, that's part of our existence too. And that's what he said that this is the expression of the So I was part of that group which was bringing, uh, bringing awareness and that kind of education among children right from the foundation that they are learning this kind of stuff in the preschools and kindergarten schools. Then I was proud, part of another movement called Proud, which is Progressive Education Theory, where uh, uh, we try to develop uh, self, at least conceptually, because we still don't have enough resources to fully manifest it. Uh, a concept called a self-sufficient economic zone, which means that like you have a town of Phoenix, and you want everything what people need in this area of Phoenix should be all produced locally. 
improving your high-end electronics. It's all should be happening right here. So that, that's the kind of idea what we have, and we are trying to work on these kind of communities. We call them master units. So they are self-sufficient economic zones. So the whole world right now is divided politically. And our concept is that it should be divided based on self-sufficient economic zones. Like half of Rocky Mountains is in one place, and half in another place. It's like a political division. Instead, should be like there is an area where people are culturally together, they have same kind of topography, same kind of economic needs. That should be one sufficient sufficient economic zone. So like that, that's how the zoning should be. Uh, in fact, uh, incidentally or accidentally or whatever, uh, the modern day corporations and the big businesses are thinking of same thing, they call it uh, special economic zones. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we have a little uh, softer and better view on uh, self-sufficient economic zones. I was part then uh, I was part of another um, group called Anand Marga Universal Relief Team, where we have formed relief stores and uh, built teams, which is always on standby if disaster happens. Things like Haiti, our group went there and did a lot of stuff. And of course, we get funded sometimes by grants, uh, from some, sometimes from government agencies also, and also from non-government agencies. So we, I was associated with that effort, that group as well. So this is about me, but I'm going to share with you today some of the uh, 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 views on self-sustenance in a community living. And just trying to add something on top of what uh, brother has said and sister has said. Just to add on top of that, uh, to be able to s sustain in a community, we need to have a kind of uh, uh, two-pronged approach. And one is restraining oneself, which uh, we call it, we have a term in our language called aparigraha, which means that we try to limit the usage of how much we have. Like I may have like 20 pairs of shoes, which actually I don't need. <laughs> so I'm basically just accumulating. So I will start to say I'll have 19, 18, 16, down to I may just be able to manage with two pairs of shoes. So that, that kind of lifestyle we have to promote, same thing with the clothes, and or else we go and shop for the food and we just buy lots of stuff and then at the end of the month we throw like 30% of it and go and buy the fresh. So it keeps on and on so that way. We, we restrain ourselves in such a way that I am ultimately helping the humanity and beyond humanity and beyond the beyond humanity, which is the inanimate things also the follow the So that that helps in the community living, that we all are restrained because these kind of five things in our life, which is food, clothes, medicine, shelter, and education. This is not for accumulation, it's for our sustenance, which we need, it's our minimum requirements. It's not for enjoyment. I mean, I eat food, let's say I'm enjoying some food and I eat some of it because I am hungry, then I'll eat it only as much as I'm, I'm hungry. But if I'm eating that food to enjoy, the, the stomach will say that I had enough of it. And then you keep on still loading and the stomach will say, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> this is my limit. <laughs> So, so this this will happen. So all these these things what we have minimum requirement things in our life is not meant for enjoyment but for sustenance. So that kind of awareness more of it we have, and then along with that, the the other movement which I was associated with, and on some occasions I still go and try to work on some projects like that, uh, where the master units where we try to. Uh, build this kind of community where we try to produce locally as much as possible. But a couple of things which is a kind of forewarning for our future. And I think everybody must think about that. And I think with that I will conclude for my short talk here. That we must promote conserving seeds as much as possible. Because this will be a huge crisis in the future. I think it already has become a crisis as of today. Try to find the real, the, the native seeds of corn. We can't find any. 
this the corn what we grow is made for petroleum or something else. <laughs> the original corn, if you want to eat, drive down to Tapachula, Guatemala, and try to find the actual corn. I have been there. I have tasted it. It's so nice. <laughs> they, they grow it locally in the field, the Mayan people. Wow, it's beautiful. So that that's one kind of warning we have that in future we are at the corporations would like to we have a, have monopoly on these seeds. Which they would like to give you seeds which will not grow next time. <laughs> one corn, that's it. <laughs> you can't make seeds out of that. They would like to modify in such a way. They they have already done it to some extent. And they're in the process of doing it more. Then the other warning we have for our future is water conservation. That uh, we may have in the time to come a huge, huge problem with what kind of water we have available for our day to day use, for our survival, for our day. So that way I think the human society, which means the human race is the most prominent race on this planet and that's they are their role is like a big brothers. So they have to take this responsibility of doing something for the ecology and they have to be able to save the glaciers enough of it. They have to save the lakes, they have to save the ponds, rivers. They have to do enough to do that. So I think this is something that we should all be aware about and be constantly thinking. And I believe that as the time goes by we will have lot of opportunity to expose ourselves to this kind of discussions and explore ideas as to how we can achieve some of the, the how we can alleviate some of the crisis which to me in my thinking is almost destined to come. We probably can't avoid it from coming so we can take all precautionary measures. So with that I will conclude and definitely yes some questions we can take on from now.